Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this meeting of the TPO Board for Wednesday, March 9th. Uh, at this time, let's please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Can we please have a roll call? Commissioner Cohen? Here. Commissioner Kemp? Here. Commissioner Overman? Here. Commissioner Myers? Here. Commissioner Smith? Here. Councilman Maniscalco? Councilman Citro? Here. Councilman Dingfelder? Mayor Ross? Vice Mayor Donahue. Commissioner Kilton? Here. Gina Evans? Here. Adelie Legrand? Here. Greg Slater? Here. Charles Kluke? Here. Planning Commissioner Cody Powell? Here. And Board Member Vaughn? Or Melissa Snively? We do have an in-person quorum, and I do need to let you know that some members are participating virtually because of medical reasons and the local declaration of emergency. Thank you very much. And uh, Ms. Vaughn, I, I, I see you, but I didn't hear you answer the roll call. So are you, are, are we able to hear, are you able to hear us? Doesn't look like it. There we go. Are you able to hear me? Yeah, we, we can now. Okay. All right. Thank you for identifying yourself. Just wanted to make sure that you were recorded as being here. And for those of you that are participating virtually, uh, I'm going to do my best to see it when you raise your hand. Uh, and if, if you feel as though for some reason you're being missed, wave, and one of us will, will, uh, will double back to you. Uh, at this time, uh, we'll entertain uh, a motion for approval of the minutes from February 9th. Second. We have a motion from Commissioner Kemp, seconded by Commissioner Myers. Uh, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. All right. Thank you very much. We're now going to move on to public comment. We have 30 minutes total with up to three minutes per speaker. Uh, we have six people that have signed up for public comment this morning. Uh, the first is Christopher Hatton, followed by Rick Fernandez and Mauricio Rosas. Uh, good morning, uh, Commissioners. I just wanted to uh, speak again. My name is Christopher Hatton. I'm with uh, Kimley Hornet Associates. I'm a registered uh, professional traffic engineer, um, and I'm one of the uh, engineers assisting the uh, rhythm development, uh, formerly known as the University Square Mall redevelopment, uh, and in conjunction working with RD management. Uh, I just wanted to speak uh, just a couple of minutes about uh, the upcoming Fowler Avenue PD&E. Um, it is getting underway. We've been in coordination with the FDOT, um, and I've been kind of requested of working with our team, uh, including the RD team, Mark Sharp, and some others, to provide kind of our feedback on the type of transit lineage that the rhythm development would like to see uh, as this moves forward, the PD&E on Fowler. Uh, our focus, obviously, would to be to have the design uh, provide the best in terms of safety, uh, transit access, uh, project access, and ultimately future flexibility for the improvements that will be going along on Fowler. Uh, and based upon these factors, uh, we believe that the uh, business and transit, otherwise known as bat lanes along Fowler Avenue, uh, provide the, the best opportunity to provide uh, safety access and, again, flexibility for the future development. Uh, we do understand that uh, we've again been talking with Craig Fox at the FDOT. There are no uh, currently scheduled public meetings. Uh, we look forward to being involved in those when they do get um, moving forward. Uh, we know that they'll be coming in front of you all as well, uh, probably in late spring or early summer. Uh, so we look forward to uh, coordinating with that and being part of that. But we just wanted to um, put forth our uh, initial opinions based upon some of the evaluations and analysis that we've done uh, for the battle. Thank you. Thank you very much. Rick Fernandez, followed by Mauricio Rosas, and then Nicole Perry. Thank you, Chair Cohen. Uh, Rick Fernandez uh, calling in from Tampa Heights. 
I have two time donors, Connie Rose and uh, Michelle Cookson. Uh, I think you need to confirm them. Yes, let me let me make sure that they're there. Um, Ms. Rose, are you there? Yes, Chairman. Yes, we I do am. And, and Ms. Rose, uh, we do have an updated list for 10 a.m. that was emailed out uh, a little bit ago. I believe the list you were looking at was the 8.30 a.m. All right. Well, if someone wants to get me the updated list, I'll be happy to work from that. Um, but in, in the meantime, uh, Ms. Cookson, are you there? Hi, yes, hello. I am. I'd like to donate my time to Rick, please. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Rick, you can, you. you can go ahead and proceed. All right, thank you. Uh, that just took about a minute of my time, so I'll talk a little bit faster. Um, and I don't need to take it all. Uh, it's been seven years since the words Tampa Bay Express were first uttered in Tampa Heights. We've been proud to stand with our friends and neighbors from Tampa's heartland, Seminole Heights, Ebor, East Tampa, downtown, et cetera. Uh, we've been opposed to interstate expansion through our stories, uh, storied communities from the beginning. Some of you found your political footing advancing the same arguments we have made, and I thank you for that. Most recently, there is evidence that many, if not all, of you have cast votes to expand the downtown interchange as recently as October of 2021 without realizing the impact that expansion would have on Tampa Heights. I extend grace in characterizing those votes as secondary to FDOT's pattern and practice of miscommunication dating back to at least January of 2020. Miscommunication regarding project details impacting the interstate retention walls along the eastern boundary of Tampa Heights. We first learned FDOT's plans to further extend the interstate's footprint into the community in November of 2021, specifically November 17. From that date to this, we have labored to develop a record establishing FDOT's acts and omissions. The issues were first raised via email to TPO staff on December 1, 2021. That email thread is attached to my written filings, which I incorporate by reference. That email thread shows staff's initial unwillingness to address the issue and also staff's lack of knowledge regarding the subject retention wall relocations. The record has been painstakingly developed during several meetings of the CAC and the TPO board since December. The CAC has passed a resolution during its January 5 meeting of this year, and just last week, a motion to strike TIP Amendments 8 and 9. In the aggregate, these two documents establish the facts and our prayers for relief. Both documents also are attached to my filings. We want what was promised to us in January of 2020 no right-of-way impacts secondary to the DTI quick fix. And let me say that in English so our friends at DOT can understand. No further expansion of the interstate footprint into Tampa Heights. The CAC has recommended multiple paths to that goal, from re-engineering the offending lane movements to striking them from the tip altogether. We are certainly open to considering creative engineering solutions from FDOT. On February 9 of this year, this board devoted 90 minutes of a scheduled two-hour meeting to a de facto evidentiary hearing and board discussion on these issues. Commissioner Cohen, you closed the discussion, quoting in part, this has not been our best day as a community. What we need to do is use this as a learning tool to do better. You go on to say, sir, the one thing I want to reiterate is that this project has not even been awarded to a contractor yet. There's still time to affect it in its details. 
As of this writing, there has been no FDOT, TPO staff, or TPO board action to change the trajectory of FDOT's destructive plans. On the contrary, on January 31, 2022, just a few weeks ago, FDOT destroyed the historic property at 1902 North Lamar. And just yesterday, March the 8th, they drove stakes in the ground to mark the positions of new retention walls. One of those stakes is about 100 yards south of my house. The community has not the luxury of patience, ladies and gentlemen. We have spoken directly to you in public comment and through your Citizens Advisory Committee. We have done our job and we have followed the rules. The opportunity to right wrongs and avoid serious damage now rests with nine locally elected members of the TPO board and anyone else willing to follow. Together, you nine control a majority of the vote and the power to change our lives for the better in ways we could only have imagined possible in 2015 when TBX first surfaced. The only question is, will you exercise that power for the benefit of your constituents? Time is of the essence. Please initiate action now to stop additional interstate retention wall intrusion in Tampa Heights. Consider the CAC's resolution set up to you in January and the motion to strike TIP Amendments 8 and 9 as great places to start your discussion. I'll cede the rest of my time to the speaker pool and thank you for your courtesy. Okay, thank you very much. Mauricio Rosas. He did not call in. Okay, next on the list is Nicole Perry, followed by Robert Miley. Hi, um, my name is Nicole Perry. Uh, my family and I live at, right by the downtown interchange in Tampa Heights. Um, workers recently stood outside our home marking sewer lines for FDOT's desired expansion. Um, our beloved neighborhood in Tampa's first suburb has already borne the effects of the highway during its creation and continues to weather the effects every day. Our families and others around us are exposed to air pollution, sound pollution, um, decreased property values for those who live closest to it. Historic properties such as the Lamar Building um, have been and continue to be destroyed because of it. It's been shown time and time again across the world that wider highways will not improve traffic in the long run due to induced demand, and they'll certainly make it much, much worse in the short run. Tampa needs real solutions, real mass, mass transit, and to stop destroying its history and hurting its residents, such as my family. I oppose further IP75 retention wall intrusions along the eastern boundary of Tampa Heights. I understand a motion to strike amendments eight and nine of the TIP has been circulated to you. I incorporate that motion by reference and fully support it. Striking those two amendments would protect Tampa Heights and its designated historic district from further structural intrusions at the hands of FDOT. Tampa needs to say no to FDOT once and for all on this issue. It is very clear that they will continue to do anything they can to get what they want, including withholding truth and basically continuing to rebrand the same old ideas that have been voted against time and time again and continue to try to wear down the residents of Tampa. Tampanians have strongly opposed highway widening. It is truly unbelievable that this is again an issue, and I beg you and many, many people who I know, you know, may not have had the time to call in but have emailed are also begging you, please do your jobs and stick up for Tampa and its residents' wishes. I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, Robert Miley and then Matt Suarez. Yes, my name is Robert Miley, and me and my family live in historic Ybor, and uh, I oppose further I-275 retention wall intrusion along the eastern boundary of Tampa Heights. I understand a motion to strike amendments eight and nine of the TIP have been circulated among you. I incorporate that motion by reference and support it fully striking those amendments would protect Tampa Heights and is and its designated historic district from further structural intrusion and damage at the hands of FDOT. 
uh, it just you just can't sac sacrifice history in neighborhoods uh, for for this. That that's all I have to say. Thank you very much, uh, Matt Suarez, and then Doreen Jessup and Adrian Rodriguez. Yes, Matt Suarez, 406 West of Zeal Street, Unit 508, Tampa, Florida, 33606. Um, honorable members of the uh, governing board, uh, just wanted to identify uh, during this meeting, I would like to request the TPO's governing board file and approve a motion to strike amendments eight and nine from the Hillsborough County TPO's transportation improvement program, otherwise known as the TIP. I'm asking for these amendments to be removed from the TIP due to my opposition of further I-275 retention wall intrusions along the eastern boundary of Tampa Heights. The, T the TPO governing board proceeding with this action would protect Tampa Heights, uh, the Tampa Heights Historic District from further uh, structural intrusion and damage uh, uh, that the Florida Department of Transportation is planning to impose on it through its downtown Tampa interchange safety and operational improvements project. Uh, I also wanted to uh, identify to board members that it's important to note that the TPO's governing board is still in, arguably uh, maintains unilateral control over this issue because the said project has not entered its design phase uh, pursuant to 23 CFR section 771.113. Activities relating to a final design cannot proceed until a record of decision is issued for an environmental impact statement uh, with a record of decision relating to the Tampa Interstate Study Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement being issued in September of 2020. The noted preliminary engineering that uh, uh, the TPO director keeps on identifying as being a point of no return and things of that nature uh, is, is a study. It, it is an engineering study. Uh, it is not design. So it needs to be cleared up uh, in relation to the TPO director, uh, the term associated with design. A contract is not scheduled to be awarded uh, until late June uh, in relation to the downtown interchange project. Uh, so uh, it is uh, through uh, this congressional regulation uh, federal regulation that uh, it's arguably that that the board still maintains control over decision uh, decisions relating to revoking amendments from the tip. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doreen Jessup, Adrian Rodriguez, and then Josh Frank. Hello, uh, my name is Doreen Jessup. Um, like. Rick Fernandez and many others. Um, it's seven years now that I've become, been coming before this board, so there won't be any surprise about um, my position. Um, I was reflecting on the board itself and remembering that it was at an OSHMA meeting, an Old Seminole Heights Neighborhood Association meeting, that Pat Kemp, who was not yet a county commissioner, explained to me and a few others that the MPO, which it was then instead of the TPO, um, can stop this. Um, you don't have to blame FDOT. The MPO can stop this. They're just choosing not to do it. And ironically, that's exactly where we are today. So for the record, I oppose the retention wall intrusion in Tampa Heights and the addition of lanes on I-275 through Tampa's urban neighborhoods including downtown, Tampa Heights, Seminole Heights, Ebor, and Sulphur Springs. These walls and lanes will harm our communities and ultimately the entire Tampa Bay region while doing nothing to improve highway safety or ease traffic congestion. Many, if not all of you on the TPO know this to be true and still are choosing not to stop it. I am asking you to please exercise your promise and your duty to represent the interests of the community and reverse course. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Adrian Rodriguez, Josh Frank. Good morning. Uh, my name is Adrian Rodriguez. I'm a Tampa native and I have many friends who reside in Tampa Heights. I'm calling in support of Rick Fernandez and the Tampa Heights community 
and I am opposed to the interstate expansion. Campus history is very important to us and should always be first and foremost. Thank you very much. Thank you. Josh Frank, and then Clive Hahn, and then Lena Young-Green. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time repeating the same things that have been said from uh, Rick Fernandez and Matt Suarez. Um, as many of you know, I also sit on your CAC, um, as well as a variety of other boards across the city and region, um, not, not including, not, to, not just limited to transportation, but also land use, architectural design guidelines, et cetera. And so I, I come to you with an informed opinion, and I, I, I hate to repeat myself over and over again, but you know, I think this board needs to understand the leverage that it has in terms of the transportation improvement plan list. The TIP list in other jurisdictions, other TPOs, other MPOs without, throughout the state really use the TIP as the last bastion, the true vetting process for every project that makes its way onto the list. As you've heard from Mr. Suarez, you know, projects entering the design phase is a Florida statute, but how, that's never been challenged. So, you know, what constitutes a design phase is something that yes, is on paper, but at the same time could very well be argued that every project that enters your list uh, could be considered within the design phase, especially a design build project, which is unique. So again, there's no reason why you can't use the TIP as a stronger gate um, that says projects cannot enter the TIP until they've proven themselves worthy. And, and, and as it relates to the motion uh, and the items on the TIP that have been uh, designated for removal, those items have not earned their place on the TIP. Not only uh, do we know they're going to increase capacity, even though FDOT considers operational improvements not to add capacity, which I don't know how you can add lanes but not add capacity. That's just magic on their part. Um, but at the same time, we know that these projects are going to add to all of the other things that we've heard about, induced demand, environmental uh, impacts, um, equitable impacts, that sort of thing. So um, I'll say what I've said every time I speak to you is that you need to view this tip uh, as a way to reduce trips from our system overall. More lanes only means more cars. And um, with that, I, I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And then we have Clive Hahn and Lena Young-Green, and that is, uh, that show Lena Young-Green will be the last of our speakers this morning. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, appreciate your time this morning. Uh, I live on uh, Elmore Ave, uh, directly adjacent to the West Barrier of 275. And uh, since uh, FDOT has started working on the east side of the highway, um, definitely uh, increased shaking has been felt on our side of the highway. You know, increased staining on my house has been observed and also definitely seen increased pollution uh, due to this construction. So, and that's on the other side of the highway. So, you know, over the past week, we've seen many, many construction um, vehicles drive up and down Elmore. And my family and I are literally sitting on pins and needles daily worrying about, will they stop in front of our house today to start digging? And uh, to Rick Fernandez's point, you know, we did, we, we did notice the stakes in the ground, um, you know, sort of, you know, I guess mapping out uh, where they're going to uh, increase or, or move the retention wall. So, you know, with all that being said, um, you know, echo, you know, my friends uh, and, my, and my neighbors, you know, that have spoke, spoken before me. So I do oppose further I-75 retention wall intrusions into our community. I do understand there's a motion to strike amendments eight, nine, and tip been circulated amongst all of you. I incorporate that motion by reference and support it fully. Striking these two amendments would protect our community and is designated uh, the historic district from further structural intrusion at the hands of FDOT. And uh, my wife and I, uh, we now have a young daughter now, we're new to the community and did not have a chance to you know, vote for the current officials. But I hope our elected officials do listen to our voice and protect the attractiveness of our growing community. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much. And our final speaker this morning is Lena Young-Green. Uh, good morning. Good Thank morning. you once again for allowing us to come in and um, speak with you all and share our community's perspective on the decisions that you all have to make. We are again talking about safety and about the extension of these walls by Department of Transportation and the impact on our historic district of tearing down our historic buildings. 
um, again, in Tampa Heights, we heard 40 years ago that every time there was a change announced by DOT, it had to do with safety. The only one that did not talk so much about safety was the TBX project. But each time there's another safety issue, there are more walls, more extension into our historic areas, into the urban core that should have its own protections. Even from the beginning when transportation um, interstates were designed, they deliberately went into the poor communities and the communities of color. Today we keep hearing there's another safety and every safety that's announced, it's again impacting us in our communities. We have health issues that studies have demonstrated clearly, clearly impact the communities that live around interstates, as well as the, the transportation and ongoing um, accidents close to the interstates, again, impacting our urban core. Please, please support the um, resolution that, that's coming to you from the CAC, and please stop the OT from continuing to grow and grow and grow into our neighborhoods. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that closes public comment for this morning. We are gonna move on now to committee reports and advance comments. We will start with Bill Roberts, who is the CAC chair. And uh, after that, we'll move on to Davida Franklin from the TPO staff, and then we will hear from our director, uh, Ms. Alden. Mr. Roberts. Thank you, Chairman Cohen. Good morning, I'm Bill Roberts. I chair your uh, Citizens Advisory Committee to the TPO. Um, this is my report of our March 2nd CAC meeting. We did have a uh, in-person quorum, so we were able to take action. Uh, the CAC approved two action items, uh, one of which was the uh, three TIP amendments um, that are on your agenda today, as well as the Community Transportation Coordinator Evaluation. Um, we deferred all of our status reports uh, because of the length of other discussion during the meeting. After considerable discussion, uh, the CAC moved by a vote of 10 to 8 to request uh, this TPO board to amend the TIP to remove two amendments uh, from the October 21st uh, TIP. Those are relative to the downtown interchange. Uh, we also had uh, the opportunity to hear comments from DOT Secretary Gwynn uh, regarding some comments that were made during our meeting. We appreciate his attending uh, and joining us in the meeting. Uh, the, T the CAC also heard uh, comments from Cameron Clark, uh, attorney to the TPO. And we had a, uh, a very good discussion regarding the Sunshine Law uh, as it relates to members uh, and messages that may be transmitted between them via email or social media. And finally, the CAC moved to ask the uh, DOT to have a legal representative uh, join us at future meetings uh, to discuss DOT's legal obligations. Uh, there is a full report of our committee meeting in your packet, and I'd be happy to answer any questions, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Roberts. I, I don't see any questions at this time. Um, so we will move on to Ms. Franklin and uh, then to Ms. Alden. Thank you for that report. Good morning. Here's your summary of committee reports and public comments. So pertaining to today's consent agenda, the Transportation Disadvantaged, Disadvantaged Coordinating Board and Technical Advisory Committee, along with what you just heard, the Citizens Advisory Committee, approved TIP amendments for the Gibsonton Drive widening study and heart maintenance facility. And pertaining to today's action items, the Livable Roadways Committee and Technical Advisory Committee approved the commuter, commuter Benefits Ordinance Request Letter. Now, for your upcoming meetings, there will be a status report that you'll hear on the low-cost air quality monitoring pilot study, and the Technical Advisory Committee did hear that status report. For your summary of public comments, we had four comments come in for the TIP amendment for the Gibsonton Drive widening study. Dennis Shepard and Nancy Doolin did request the improvements. 
but Chris Todd suggested improvements to Bloomingdale Avenue instead, and Stephanie Claus Todd thinks that a widening, widening project would worsen conditions. Concerning the location of the I-275 sound walls in Tampa Heights and the TIP Amendments 8 and 9 for the I-4 and I-275 downtown interchange, we did have a few comments come in, and uh, we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, about 12 comments come in that opposed both of those items. Matthew Suarez did oppose the TIP amendments along with Dana Lazarus and Frank Constantino and Catherine Kitty Wallace opposed the wall movement. And again, there were about a dozen other comments that came in for both of those items in opposition of them. Concerning the TIP revision process, Matthew Suarez and Rick Fernandez did voice concerns about that process. Chris Vela did have some comments. He suggests that Hillsborough Area Regional Transportation Authority, also known as HART, places a station on Cass Street or Main Street instead of Palm Avenue. And he thinks the TPO wants to enforce away crashes in lieu of other Vision Zero prevent preventive measures. Uh, Brightline gaining right-of-way access along I-4 and their expansion into Central Florida. We did get three comments about that. Uh, Chris Vela thinks that completion will involve an environmental review due to wetlands. Walter Slipecki thinks the governor, governor may block the process or the project. And Rock King thinks the trains look pretty good. Vision Zero, we had a news story post about that. We have received two comments about that. And we also received a comment about um, feedback from that the uh, the county was looking for for uh, the transportation uh, projects that they have going on and um, someone did suggest a red light update at Fowler and 50th Street. We also had uh, Cornelius Constantino announce a website for the solar array pedestrian bridge concept for the span of the Howard Franklin Bridge that's scheduled to be demolished and we did have someone write in about concerns about email communications between members of the Citizens Advisory Committee that may conflict with the Sunshine Law, as uh, we heard earlier from the chair. Uh, we had a comment about bike lane recommendations for West Shore Boulevard, south of Gandhi, as well as concerns about vibrations from the PAL driving along North I-275 from a construction project. And we did get some suggestions for uh, online public engagement, as well as a comment supporting the Boulevard study. So all of these comments, with the exception of seven of them, um, were emailed to you uh, in a, an attachment. So we did get a few that came in later than what we had um, set for our deadline. And um, that is the conclusion of my report. So Ms. Alden will give a quick report on the policy committee meeting that just occurred. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Alden. Thank you, sir. Uh, there were three items on the policy committee agenda this morning. Um, the policy committee did approve the draft letter that is on your consent agenda about class two noise walls. The policy committee also had a great and robust discussion about the I-75 PD&E study and asked that the board send a letter of comment to the Department of Transportation about it. I will be drafting that and we'll bring that back to you for your review and approval next month. Um, finally, we took a look at some options for the TPO's apportionment plan update, which is a post-census apportionment plan. Uh, and uh, again, we'll be bringing back some options to you for your consideration. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, we've also heard quite a bit this morning uh, about concerns about um, the downtown interchange project. Uh, and what its physical intrusion might be in the Tampa Heights neighborhood. Um, the department went out yesterday and placed some stakes in the ground uh, showing where the noise walls would be proposed to be moved. Uh, and I went out in the late afternoon evening and took a few photographs, which I would be happy to share with the board for your information. If you'd like to take a look at that, um, I would suggest if I could that uh, that we postpone discussion until our old and new business section of the agenda um, because we do have uh, a time-sensitive action item, our TIP amendments. I uh, don't want to lose a quorum, and we also have a guest speaker um, from Brightline who has traveled some distance to be here this morning. 
uh, and uh, it, it's taken a little, little while for us to arrange this presentation. Um, so if we could, uh, our attorney, Mr. Clark, is happy to stay uh, and discuss with the board what the board's options might be uh, if you'd like to take some action. Uh, but if you'd like to go ahead and take a look at some of the photographs uh, just from yesterday's identification of where the noise all would be, I'd be happy to share those. That would be great. If you could share those, that would be, I think, uh, good Did for the board. Do you need a motion to change the agenda to address that? This is advanced comments. I Excellent. Think we're, Thank I you. think we're well within the, the okay. confines of the agenda. Thanks. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Cheryl, if you could pull those up, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, and so, as I said, this is just my informal uh, photography uh, yesterday afternoon, and I did not have a map of where these stakes were placed, so I just took photographs where I spotted them. Um, so this is what the stakes look like. Um, next slide, Cheryl. Um, and so I began uh, at, the, at the north end. Um, so this is just south of Florabraska Avenue. I'm on Elmore Avenue, I'm looking south. So we're just gonna continue heading south. You can see that first stake very close to the existing noise wall. Um, next slide, please. And then going a little bit further south, the next stake a little farther out, uh, and then uh, you know, I just have an arrow showing where that other stake is in the background. Next slide, please, Cheryl. Uh, and then moving south further on um, Flora Brasca Avenue. This is just north of Columbus. Uh, and so the stake there is up on the hill above the first uh, retention wall. Next slide, please. And then moving further south, um, this photograph is taken next to the Tampa Heights Civic Association building, which is tented right now. Um, so here uh, I'm, uh, I'm on Palm Avenue, more or less. I'm looking north. Um, the Tampa Heights Civic Association building is on the left. Um, you can see the stakes kind of in, in the middle. Um, the Tampa Heights Community Garden is ahead down the trail on the left side of the trail. Uh, next slide, please, Cheryl. Uh, then turning around, going south, uh, and then looking back at the Tampa Heights uh, Civic Association building. You can see here, so this is where, where the noise wall would start to come out farther. Um, and so you can see here, it's now out just on the, just past where the greenway is right now. And my understanding is that that will be relocated and there will be new landscaping. Next slide, please. This is now turning <coughs> around south from more or less the same spot. So um, just a little south of Palm Avenue, looking south. Next slide, please. And then continuing south. So here, I'm just about at 7th Avenue. You can see the stakes on the left. There's a stake uh, on the far side of 7th Avenue on the left. On the right, you start to see the Mobley Park Apartments. Um, next slide, please, Cheryl. And then there's just a couple more. So this is continuing to move south. I'm standing at 7th Avenue, looking south. The Mobley Park Apartments are on the right. Um, there's a stake on the left. And then next slide, please, Cheryl. So continuing south. Uh, now I'm almost to Henderson, uh, stake uh, very close to the edge of Central Avenue. Again, Mobley Park Apartments to the right. Uh, and then in the background, you can also see another stake um, just outside the Mobley Park Apartments. And then last slide, please, Cheryl. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, there's one more. Okay, so this is turning around, looking back north, basically the same stakes, and then next slide, please. Um, and so... Uh, this is just south of Henderson. On the right, the Mobley Car Park Apartments. Next slide, please. And then going on south, again, the Mobley Park Apartments on the right, that stake in the middle. So this is just for your information. I'd be happy to make this available to anyone who's not able to get out there physically and take a look at it. Um, but we appreciate the department for clarifying what the location of the project is. And if we could then discuss this further under old and new business, it would help us to move along with our agenda. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Alton. And then we will do that. We will uh, move on right now to the consent agenda, and we'll come back to this item under new business. Uh, the consent agenda um, there has four items in it today. Can we entertain a motion for approval? So move for moved. approval. We have a motion from Commissioner second. Myers. I heard a second, but I'm not second. sure. A second from Commissioner Kemp. Um, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Uh, aye. 
Opposed? All right, motion passes. We have one action item this morning, and that is our TIP amendments for Gibsonton Drive widening study and the heart maintenance facility. Connor McDonald from the TPO staff uh, will present these items, and there will be a roll call vote required uh, once we're done with the presentations. Good morning, Connor McDonald, TPO staff. Um, can everyone see my screen all right? Yes, we can see the screen. Perfect, thank you. Um, again, Connor McDonald, TPO staff, here to present a type of amendments for the heart. Can, can you just maybe speak a little bit slower and into your microphone just so we can hear you a tad better? Thanks. Absolutely. Um, Connor McDonald, here to present the amendments, um, three amendments, heart maintenance facility, and Gibson Drive widening study. There's three amendments requested by the Florida Department of Transportation to add funds to the year 2022. Um, one amendment is a heart bus replacement pool. This is removal of four million in SU funds. Um, the other to add that four million to the maintenance facility item. And the third amendment is to add 201,000 for the Gibson Drive widening study. The heart maintenance facility amendments came from a TPO board directive in November 2021 to move funds from the bus replacement to the facility. I had the chance to tour the facility myself, and I saw firsthand the issues the facility faces. For one, the facility is downhill, sort of in a basin, so it's prone to heavy flooding from sheets of water that come flowing into the area. It was originally built in the 80s as a large truck repair facility, so the design itself isn't conducive to an efficient process. For example, due to low ceilings, the buses can't be raised for repair in half of the garage area. And in addition, the counterintuitive design means that buses must make a 90 degree turn to go from fueling to washing. Not only are these issues great in and of themselves, they also make it difficult to retain talent as many mechanics have chosen to work at more sustainable facilities. I was able to take some photos of the facility during my tour in the top left, you see where the buses can be raised in half the garage area. In the top right, you see he um, heavy cracking in the concrete. In the bottom left, you see that difficult 90 degree turn. Um, you're looking straight ahead, the fueling station, and on the left is the washing station. And in the bottom right, you see residue um, from interior flooding in the facility. The first amendment is to remove SU funds totaling four million from the bus replacement item. You see here. And the second amendment is to add those funds to the maintenance facility book. The next amendment is for the addition of funds for a PD and E study on Gibson Drive from Fern Hill Drive near I-75 to US 301. PD and E studies, as defined by UPTOT ensure transportation projects are developed with current engineering standards, project cost, and minimization of social and environmental impact. The project will include some public engagement, including a kickoff meeting, small group meetings, and a public hearing. The amendment is to add 201,000 for a pd and &E study in the year 2022. As part of our public outreach pilot, we have taken some measures to help inform the public this includes posting of three signs, a web page, a newsletter press release, and social media posts. With that, the recommended action today is to approve the three amendments to the fiscal year 21-22 tip. I conclude my presentation. Are there any comments or questions? Yes, Commissioner Overman. Thank you. Um, on the Gibson uh, project, is that taking that uh, what feels like a collector artery road to highway status in the terms of the expansion? And would it require uh, community or um, community impact analysis as part of the, uh, the PD&E? Because um, it does appear there's a great deal of a develop development adjacent to Gibsonton Drive. So I was curious about the scope of that project and, and the impact on the communities that, that it is um, being proposed. Um, great question. I may call on District 7 to see if they are more familiar with the scope or someone from Hillsborough County. I know they've been working together. Um, I do know the PD&E study will evaluate the community impact, um, but I'm not 
too sure that the scope has been developed at this point, how, how much the scope has been developed. Okay, thank you. Ms. Alden, do you want to? I, I could just share that a, a PD&E study typically would would look at those impacts. It would be defining what are what are the options. Are you able to stay within the right of way? Uh, how you're going to address drainage, traffic, noise effects, all of all of those things would be what you would look at in the PD&E study. Uh, and of course, with um, opportunities for uh, people in that area to participate. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, would the yeah, would just the, would the study be for all of Gibsonton Drive or just a portion? So right now the proposal is for um, a PD&E study from on Gibson Drive from Fernhill Drive, which is near I-75 to US 301. So it's not the entirety of Gibson Drive. Any other questions from board members before we uh, entertain a motion on this item? I do not see any, um, although I can't see what's going on with the people that are participating remotely, um, but I, I don't see any additional questions. I'll move approval. We have a motion from Commissioner Kemp. Second. Seconded by Commissioner Myers, and let me uh, ask for a roll call vote on this item, please. Commissioner, <clears throat> Commissioner Cohen? Yes. Commissioner Kemp? Yes. Commissioner Overman? Yes. Commissioner Myers? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Councilman Citro? Yes. Is Councilman Dingfelder online? I don't see him. Um, Commissioner Kilton? Yes. Gina Evans? Yes. Adelie Legrand? Yes. Greg Slater? Yes. Charles Kluve? Yes. Planning Commissioner Cody Powell? Yes. And Board Member Vaughn? Yes. The motion passes 13 to 0. Okay, thank you very much. We have two status reports this morning. The first is the Bright Line update. Uh, Katie Mitzner, Director of Public Affairs, um, or Christine Kefauver, Senior Vice President for Corporate Development of Brightline, is with us. Oh, there we go. Good morning. I think it's on. She's. How's that? Is that That's better? much better. Thank ah, you. There we go. Hi. Once again, Christine Kefauver with Brightline Trains. Um, Katie accepted the invitation um, when this became available to us, um, and I, I leaned into this opportunity, and I really want to thank Cheryl uh, from your administrative staff. She's been very helpful in getting the materials to you. Um, so Brightline Trains, um, we are so excited. We'll talk a little bit about where we've been, what we're doing right now, and where we plan to go in the future. Um, I'm relatively new to Brightline. I started about a year ago, but I'm not new to high-speed rail. So I was with Orange County government when this guy, Ed Taranchek, calls Mayor uh, Chapin at the city at Orange County and says, hey, on the 2012 Olympic bid, let's add, uh, add high-speed rail to that. I was also a uh, staff director to Mayor Dyer as his transportation policy advisor at the city of Orlando when we accepted the high-speed rail funding to connect Tampa to Orlando. So I'm saying third time's a charm. We are going to connect Tampa to Orlando by way of high-speed rail, and I look forward to Brightline being a part of that. So next slide, please. So for those of you who don't know, high-speed rail, uh, Brightline in Florida, we are privately owned and operated, and we are really here to challenge uh, the transportation status quo. And I think of this as Brightline is about marrying two very important things, hospitality in the state of Florida with transportation and mobility. Um, and we really do look to uh, change the way that people begin to think about travel in Florida. Next slide. But we're more than just, how's that? 
we're more than just here in Florida. We have a sister project that we're working on out connecting California to Las Vegas. And that project is a higher speed train because uh, they're looking at all new technology and alignment. So that project is working concurrent with our expansion from West Palm Beach up to Orlando International Airport and then ultimately to Tampa. Um, if you don't mind, I know you guys are all looking at the slides, but has anyone in the room taken Brightline or been exposed? Yeah, so I see a few have. For those of you who haven't, I'm going to ask Cheryl to play that next slide. It's a video. And this gives you an overview of the project. Oh, good. There's usually this really loud music that comes on. Um, so let me talk you through this. So the, this is filmed before the pandemic, so no, no masks on in the videos that you see here. But we, um, in 2019, we started operations from Miami up uh, to Fort Lauderdale, then Fort Lauderdale to West Palm Beach. Um, during COVID, we paused operations, but we used that time to do two things expand and construct from what from West Palm Beach up to Orlando International Airport and we'll talk about that project and then we also upgraded our positive train control so that it can speak um, seamlessly with uh, SFRTA and other transit projects there so you can see what our, our stations look like um, they're very iconic um, but at the same time the stations in South Florida are embedded in the communities because that's where the Florida East Coast Railroad was originally and we were the parent company of that. So the expansion plan from West Palm up to uh, Orlando International Airport is 70% complete. And at the same time, we decided to go ahead and add a couple stations in South Florida as well. So here you're seeing the uh, train kind of pulling into Orlando International Airport as part of the intermodal facility that had been a long-term vision of Central Florida. At the intermodal facility, they will accommodate four different rail technologies. High-speed rail, Brightline is one of them. Their people mover is already in place at this uh, intermodal center. And then ultimately being able to accommodate Central Florida's commuter rail project and or light rail in the future. And as you can see here, that ultimate connection to Tampa is our vision. And we are working closely with the Florida Department of Transportation to accommodate us within the I-4 corridor. And I'll be happy to talk about that in, in a moment. So if we go to the next slide, you know, Brightline really, oh, can we, there we go. So this is, uh, you see a, that, that bar chart there, that's kind of a levels of congestion, the average uh, miles per hour that vehicles are going along the I-95 corridor. So that's when uh, the, the leaders of my company said that would be really ripe for not only high-speed rail, but increased rail service in the um, Miami to West Palm community. And those of us who ride back and forth between Tampa and Orlando regularly recognize that I-95 is not the only congested corridor out there and that uh, I-4 can get pretty gnarly uh, on a regular basis. And so that is why Brightline is looking at that connection, not just of the economic centers that we can connect, but also looking at alternative modes of transportation for the community. So next slide. So that's what Brightline's doing. So we looked at the uh, inner city passenger rail is really about connecting city pairs, right? And litting the communities, whether it's through Heart or Sunrail or Links, provide those regional community trips. Um, so if you look at Florida with the third largest state in the United States, I, I did some research and when you connect all of these cities, Tampa, Orlando, West Palm, Fort Lauderdale, Miami, you are now connecting an economy that is the 11th largest economy in the Western Hemisphere. That's pretty fantastic. We're already connected as a state. This provides an alternative form of transportation. And we've been very fortunate to be able to work in partnership with FDOT to, to figure out ways to solve these complex problems. So next slide. 
So you kind of saw in the videos what our stations look like. These are some of the inline stations, Aventura and Boca Raton. Those will come online in South Florida. And, and we're providing some kind of commuter-like service in through there in partnership with the counties and the cities there as well. Um, but we're about economic development and economic impact as well. So, you know, having worked for local government in Brickell, in where our, our main station is in Miami, when I saw that first Publix come back to the community after decades of not being there, you know that you're part of something very important to the fabric of a community as well. So we've been very proud of our partnerships with the local governments as we look at connectivity as well as mobility options through the area. Next slide. So here's just kind of the economic impact that Brightline is creating. I talked about us being privately owned and operated. So we're putting billions of dollars back into this economy um, as part of our construction projects and um, working to connect communities together. We've kept people working through COVID um, construction. We kept over 1,300 people employed as part of our system. And back in November, when we opened up again for our operations in South Florida, we've hired hundreds of folks to make sure that our trains run on time and that you have an amazing experience. But we're more than just that uh, service of mobility. We also see ourselves as um, part of the evolution of improving our environment as well. Um, last month, we had 92,000 riders on our system. We, once again, we just got started again in November, November 8th. It takes about a year to stabilize some of that, and I will say month over month that ridership continues to grow. We see that as ways to take cars off the road. We see that as ways of improving quality of life for folks who choose to take it, and it's not going to be for everyone. But clearly, we're seeing that there's a lot of leisure as well as business travel on our system. Next slide. So our CEO addressed our entire team earlier this week, and he talked about five main goals. And what he said is that we need to create a, a position of environmental impact, and we need to do this with intention. So it's not just about taking cars off the road. And it, you can see here that the gallons of gas used, if someone goes bright line to Miami versus fly or drive, that, that incremental improvement is, is overwhelming. We know that rail is greener, we know it's safer, <coughs> and it's a faster mode of transportation than car. Um, and we use a, a biodiesel and that's more efficient than either flying or driving. But we also are doing very intentional things within the company. All of our rail that is used for our construction project is recycled steel. Um, so we are looking at sustainability every step of the way. Our vehicle maintenance facility, which I'll show you here in a moment, where all the cars are washed, 80% of that is recycled water that we are using as part of our system as well as a cistern that is part of uh, the water collection. So trying to reduce our impact and our footprint along the way. So next slide. So here you get a much better feel of that overall map of our system. Um, and here you see we are 73% complete now from West Palm Beach to Orlando International Airport. That's pretty phenomenal. We are going to be hitting speeds of 125 miles an hour on our system. Um, and we know that along the East Coast, we, where we are going through communities, we are doing a tremendous amount of investment <coughs> on our crossings um, to improve safety. But I, I never miss an opportunity to remind <coughs> folks out and about in the community Railroad tracks, you always assume that there is a train coming, and please be mindful when the gates are down that there is indeed a train coming, and please do not try to beat the train. I know I'm not speaking to the choir here, um, but to a larger audience of folks that may be staying mindful of, of active rail corridors. Um, so we are 73% complete, like I said. We expect to be substantially complete to Orlando International by the end of this calendar year. 
and then we have to go through some testing with the Federal Railroad Administration so that we can be operational about this time next year. So folks from Orlando will be able to get all the way down to Miami on Brightline very seamlessly. And like I mentioned, we are integrated into Orlando International Airport. So that tells you where we've been, where we're kind of working to get to, that's OIA. So what's next? And that is absolutely the extension to Tampa, which is currently under development. Next slide. So this is the focus of that conversation. Um, there's been some media reports that we are uh, negotiating with the Florida Department of Transportation for the use of the I-4 footprint and corridor. And that came from a 2018 agreement that Brightline had with FDOT where we had an agreement to have rail within the I-4 corridor. There was originally a 40-foot envelope dedicated to high-speed rail way back, um, back in that 2010 time frame that we talked about. We're designing, we're well underway. But if any of you read any of the media from Central Florida, you know that there's been some conversation about the right alignment in Central Florida. I think we're pretty close to having a very positive uh, solution to all of that that uh, satisfies a lot of special interests in Central Florida and we're working really hard to resolve that. And you all know as well as anyone the power of partnership and what it takes to come to resolution and we're working really hard to get there. That being said, it will drive uh, our NEPA process and that alignment and future uh, connectivity that's being done. We know, you know, the 80 some miles between the airport and uh, Tampa, that's 60 plus miles of that is within the I-4 corridor. So we know exactly where we're going to be there. So a lot of folks here in Central, in Tampa ask, well, where are you gonna connect here? Um, and so we've been working with city staff on uh, identifying the best site for a station. It is likely in the um, Ybor City area, um, very close to I-4, because some of the guiding principles that the city staff provided to us is um, wanting to make sure that as they are working very hard to reestablish the grid network and transportation grid that um, might have been chopped up a little bit over time. They don't want anything to be done to uh, impact the hard work that's being done then, and we really respect that as well. And listening today, you know, the last thing we want to do is disrupt communities as well, and no additional, um, like, tall uh, operational ramps and so forth for bright lines. So the closer we can stay, uh, to impact at corridors, um, we feel the better it is for the communities at hand. So we've been working with city staff to, to navigate what that may look like. Um, and there's a lot of big decisions being made in that general area that drives uh, potential ridership for Brightline as well. So uh, more to come there. So lastly, I talked about the Orlando station. Um, it, next slide, please. So back to that, you can see what the intermodal facility looks like at Orlando International Airport. Their new terminal, Terminal C, will open up soon where they'll be having international travel come and go out of that new terminal that they've been working on. But the building that you see to the left, that is all the intermodal facility um, and, and will help connect all of the technologies that I talked about. Brightline will be a tenant within that, um, and we're building out as we speak almost a 40,000 square foot space within that. Next slide. So this is the vehicle maintenance facility, and I, um, I highlight this because through my many generations of working for local government, when I heard that Brightline was installing their vehicle maintenance facility west of the airport, and pointing towards Tampa, I always thought that that was really good news. And what you see there is a train inside that facility. And we had to order five additional trains from Siemens out in California. And they just arrived, they're starting to arrive. And uh, if we can play this video, um, and you'll see the team's excitement. Well, there's audio to it as well. So we didn't hear the audio a moment ago. So the audio here is, this is the train arriving at our vehicle maintenance facility and it got towed all the way across the country. That's our uh, construction lead 
Mike Segalius. And you can just see the team that's very excited about the receipt of this brand new state-of-the-art train. And it's the first time that one has arrived in Central Florida. This is Brian Williams. He, he led the vehicle maintenance facility construction. And you can see, and this is also all on airport property and how we um, kind of took vacant land and, and uh, was able to build out this vehicle maintenance facility that will handle each and every train coming through Central Florida. Um, along this alignment that we have there, it will also be able to accommodate SunRail, the commuter rail project, and help facilitate that getting to the airport eventually as that evolves into a priority for Central Florida. I do apologize that we don't have the audio for this. But I think you get a good feel for what that looks like. So lastly, for those of you who haven't explored Brightline and would like to, I invite you um, or your staff, if you are interested, once our vehicle maintenance facility gets a certificate of occupancy, which should be in the next couple weeks, if you just want to make it to Orlando and check it out and check out our train, I'll be happy to be your host if you are interested in that. And if you're interested in taking Brightline in South Florida, either as a collective body or individually, um, don't hesitate to reach out. I, there's all my contact information. I have some cards if you would like it. Um, and we'd hap be happy to help facilitate that. So with that, that completes my presentation. Uh, you can, next slide, you can kind of follow the progress of Brightline uh, through a variety of social media opportunities as well as gobrightline.com. Well, and one other thing I did over, I didn't uh, mention is we've worked really hard in South Florida to expand a seamless first and last mile uh, selection. And it, you should be able in South Florida, if you lived and worked down there, to book from your home all the way to your ultimate destination. And we have a fleet of golf carts, uh, vans, buses, um, et cetera, and scooters because we know that that is helping folks get to that first and last mile. We know that's different in Central Florida where we are going to be looking at maybe uh, larger buses to get students to UCF or folks into downtown. But when we get to Tampa, that micro mobility and that first and last mile becomes critical again. And we know that to remove the friction for any customer is helping them seamlessly hitting the easy button every single day to get to their destination, doing what we can from a technology standpoint to help make that happen. So that's our Brightline Plus program. So thank you so much. And if you have questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you very much, Commissioner Overman. Thank you. And oh, sorry. <laughs> thank you. And um, Ms. Minster, I'm very happy to hear this presentation. I, I wear actually several hats in the area of transportation in this region because I, I um, in the chair of or co-chair chair of the transportation management area as well as I sit on Tibardo with Commissioner Kemp um, as a representative from this area. And this entire area is really looking at ways that we can explore and exploit, I guess is a way of looking at it, um, our rail corridors and preserving them for use. So Brightline has been on my, my Bright project for a long time. <laughs> I'm very excited to see the progress towards moving towards Tampa and the economic opportunity that can occur as a consequence of that, marrying two major economic engines in the central uh, corridor of, east-west corridor of Florida. Um, one, I'd like to request a copy of this presentation. Um, two, I would like to ask that you work with uh, the transportation management area staff as well as the TBARTA staff to coming to do this presentation to those boards so that they're aware of the progress that, that Brightline has made in moving forward. And three, I would like to um, ask if um, we could request that the city of Tampa, since then you're working with the city on the landing zone, um, to, to give this board some understanding of, of that progress. I noticed in the backup there was a couple of maps that showed what would happen in Ebor potentially as opportunities. But I think it's incredibly important that, that this board hear um, what, those, what that progress looks like because all of us 
you know, represent some portion of that region. And while I, am, I recognize that it's the city's, you know, role in many ways of, of how they develop their land use and their connectivity, um, this board has a, a, a way of incorporating priorities for investing in those areas. And the reason I bring that up is because recently the transportation management area um, and T. Barta uh, both uh, agreed to begin the discussions in working with FDOT on the, um, on the update of the rail plan for the area. Um, and HART has on its priority list locally here the, um, uh, to update uh, or in its, in its um, priority list uh, to begin negotiating with CSX for the existing right-of-ways to explore the opportunity for pro providing some level of passenger rail. The focus has been on the Brooksville line as well as the Clearwater line. And while I, I recognize CSX is probably a little busy dealing with the whole idea of Amtrak, um, uh, we still would like to um, explore ways that we can create that connectivity. The Clearwater line or the Brooksville line, I can't remember which one, um, does connect very close to where Bright Line will be landing. So that regional northwest, northern and southern, as well as the western over to Pinellas through Clearwater at the top of the airport uh, to Clearwater and then down to St. Pete connection would create an additional engine to the economic development you're talking about and additional mobility in our region that is critical to the address the growth that's occurring in the west central region. So I do look forward to seeing you again <laughs> and, and look forward to hearing further presentations. But if you could send us the, your presentation, because we did get a small snippet as it, but it would, I don't recall seeing the actual backup to what you just presented, and I'd love to have a copy of it to review further. Thank you. Absolutely. Is that something that you all can distribute? Yes, excellent. And then also for Tibarta, we're actually on the agenda for next month, I believe. So we're working close. And and know also, you know, I think it's important to be engaged in a community. So as a business community leader, I've been working with the Tampa Bay Partnership as well, and I'm actually the co-chair of the Transportation Committee. So we feel very important that we're part of an integrated community um, and we play a part in all of that and and the evolution of conversations are incredibly important thank you very much thank you very much um, before I go on I, I don't see any other hands but there, I'm sure there are before we go on I just want to make one comment and that is I was really uh, interested in what you showed in terms of the station in Orlando and the way that it functions the way that it, it has a bright line coming into a place that then opens up to other modes of transportation. Uh, you mentioned SunRail, but you know, here, if wherever Brightline comes in is also connected to an expanded streetcar, to Amtrak, to um, Hart, to perhaps uh, a ferry that, 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 that um, can be somehow accessed from there. The more that we can, can centralize people's ability to to choose from different modes of transportation, I think the, the not only the more successful Brightline will be, but the, the further we're going to get toward actually having a real functioning transportation network that can get people out into all areas of the region. So I, I was very uh, intrigued by Orlando's station concept because I think it's very similar to what I would envision here and and and. You know, I know that FDOT has the plans for something like that at West Shore. It's going to be crucial to connect this and that West Shore Intermodal Center um, in order to, to make all of this work as well as it can work. Um, so Absolutely. And, and knowing that the Orlando International Airport was an investment by both uh, the airport and FDOT, they did it with a very generous grant from FDOT announced back in, I think, 2015. Um, and so we are just a tenant there. Um, right now, we are looking at, we would own um, a, a station here, but if there's a larger solution that there are other partners as part of that solution, 
then um, we're, we're, we're happy to engage. And connectivity, absolutely. We want that to be as seamless and integrated as possible. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Kemp. Yes, um, I'll, and I can appreciate your vision. It's the same kind of vision I have in terms of intermodal centers, but I've been to the quote unquote intermodal center. I don't even like um, that name in particular because we keep calling what we're building here intermodal centers. That's what has been said with the uh, T-BARDA plan. Um, but primarily, um, and this is where I came to understand the concept, um, is the intermodal center, which I think is probably $60 million of public taxpayer dollars for FDOT, if I remember correctly, to build that intermodal center um, in Orlando. And what the intermodal centers are primarily are parking garages. So that's primarily a parking garage where the bright line train stops, or will stop, not yet, um, and I think the SunRail, but it's a giant, massive parking garage. And it's also located, the airport in Orlando is located, it's not so prime, primely located as our airport is here. We have an airport here that I think is very special in terms of it being very close to our urban area and downtown. Um, but the Air Orlando Airport, for many of you who have been there, know that it's located kind of far out. But this terminal that they're speaking is an additional terminal that was added to the Orlando Airport that is for, uh, far from the, uh, like, I don't know, a mile or two, let's say, that has a people mover that goes from the intermodal center to the airport in the middle of, like, nowhere. Um, and I would not like to see an intermodal center like that. It sounds good when you say intermodal. It sounds good when you talk about these um, things. I think we certainly, uh, and I don't want to see a parking garage, which I've, I've really criticized our plan here, calling it the regional parking garage plan, which I think it was. We've gotten somewhat away from that. But I'd like to, you know, some of these, I just think it's really important to talk and um, honestly describe these things so that we actually do what we vision to do. And um, I would not like to see an intermodal center be anyway uh, like the intermodal center that is there in particular. I'll just say that as a critique. Of course, we're not even talking about that here. But just a, a couple of things, too. So I know it's... Um, called high-speed rail, and we were going to have a high-speed rail at one time here between connecting Tampa and Orlando, which we don't have. But I also know that you talked about speeds of 125 miles an hour. Um, and the high-speed rail, how does that, um, that is more, I just, I just like to be clear about these things. I think it's excellent project, by the way. I want to see, just like, Tampa and Orlando are connected by Amtrak now. People don't really know that, that we have a, a rail line that goes there, but only once a day. Um, but um, it takes, um, I think you said 125 miles an hour um, is a, a high speed there. But I, as I understand it, it's kind of, it's actually the speed of, I just think it's good for people to understand. It's the speed of what is rail travel specialized rail travel in between long stops now um, for like Amtrak system. I don't know what Amtrak runs, but I do know that um, we get even faster between Orlando and Tampa because of the uh, secured corridor. And actually we're looking at opportunities of getting up to 150 miles an hour on the straightaways of I-4. Um, so I think technically with FRA, it's uh, higher speed rail is technically up to 125 miles an hour. And we experience, we're about 79 miles an hour up and down the Florida East Coast um, because of the number of rail crossings that we go over. But once we turn left at the Cocoa Curve, like over in Brevard County, and we start getting into our own secured corridor, that's when we start hitting higher and higher speeds. 
Um, compared to, as any of you drive on the I-4 corridor, you know, it is a nice alternative to, I call it a box of chocolates. You just don't know what you're going to get any certain day. Um, and that's just purely uh, supply and demand, right? Um, and, and DOT does a fabulous job. There's just so many people, and I think a lot of folks have already figured out. When I talked to Lakeland, they said, we've never had just this ongoing, constant level of congestion. It's because people began to find alternative routes, and, and actually folks look for the path of least resistance. So um, we, we, we are not going to solve every problem, um, but we want to be part of the collective solution. And I will say that until we get to car-free and care-free society, people's ability to connect and get to the station still remains important. And that is why parking garages are part of that connectivity, but we design our parking garages that they can ultimately be converted into housing with the ramp systems and so forth. As the community evolves, we look to be responsive. That, and that is not a critique of Brightline. That's a critique, uh, and that's a publicly taxpayer project, the intermodal garage, which is, it's not, it's not in a place that you would ever convert to housing, obviously. It's the airport footprint. Um, but it's also an airport that's located far away from everything. So it's not an opportunity. But uh, when we locate things within the city here, um, within urban areas, I want to, they, they really shouldn't be big parking garage footprints because we have ample parking. I know you're not familiar with no, here. I, but we Wall have street garage, I, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so. Ample parking so that we, I would uh, like when we do our connections here and we talk about our intermodal connections to be de minimis in terms of, uh, and I've been, this is something that I've talked about for years <laughs> de minimis in our in creating any more parking uh, within the city of Tampa uh, basically I mean I think we have uh, such ample parking that we, we wholeheartedly agree actually um, if the demand is such and the supply is already there there's no need for Brightline to add more but work in partnership we're, we're de we see that the station in Tampa is both a destination as well as an origin for folks maybe wanting to go and do business in Orlando or leisure, so. Is, um, how many trains a day do you, are, yeah. are going up and down between, um, like for instance, Miami-Dade, Fort Lauderdale, yeah. and, and we, right now? Um, we run about 17 hour, trains a day, north and south. Um, so we run about an hour, every hour um, in that service, and there's some, when we bring on those additional uh, stations, there's gonna be some 30 minute headway trips, but they're just shorter trips. Um, but yeah, absolutely, from morning to later at night, about one train an hour. And if you were do, to do the connection between, for instance, uh, when you uh, build the track to Orlando, um, from Miami um, to the, is, is that going to, I guess there's multiples, that's the big issue is what stations where it stops in Orlando. I know that that's held things up for ever, or how, or what multiple places, I guess it probably stops, I'm projecting, in Orlando. But let's say to the uh, center you mentioned at the airport there, um, it, how, what's the length of the trip from Miami to that projected to be? Um, from OIA to Miami will take a little bit over three hours to take the train. So to Tampa, it's probably going to take about a four-hour trip between... Yes something like that. That's and what is, a, um, what is the cost right now? What are the projected costs of that um, travel? Yeah, so we run, um, so whatever you're paying or getting reimbursed through your federal, um, which is I think 55 cents a mile, which is woefully low right now compared to what we're paying in fuel, whatever that rate is, we're probably comparable to that, minus your tolls and you know stopping at Wendy's and the uh, rest stop along the way. So um, it, that's ballpark, it, it, it will fluctuate, it is variable um, because of the private sector uh, component of this. But it, it's gonna be less expensive than flying, most likely, um, and, and if you are a single occupant in the car, it's still probably less than that. What's the ballpark. cost now from Miami to Palm Beach? 
Um, it depends on what class of service you take, as well as time of day. But I think if we look on the app right now, that's about uh, 20 plus dollars. But there's also opportunities to do a monthly pass and so forth. So there's a, there's a lot of packages that can be considered as part of that. But also, you know, we talk about that. But also to park in Miami, you're paying $20 a day. So the, just the cost of mobility in general is 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 high and then you know what we're also finding is that some of our commuters that are taking it they log on as soon as they get on the train and that's an hour that they're working on the train each direction so for professional services that makes a lot of sense so we have actually have a lot of attorneys working courthouse to courthouse on that okay so I, I appreciate it I've been meaning to before it paused <laughs> I was uh, ready to uh, get on the Bright Line train. I'm very anxious to see what is in Miami in terms of uh, a station there. And you know, it's pretty her- impressive. So let me know, and we'll get you hooked up. Great. I heard all good things, and um, thank you for for being here. Thank you, uh, Ms. Alden. You wanted to say something. Um, Go ahead. Uh, just just really briefly, yeah. Christine. I really appreciate you being here today. And uh, you mentioned that uh, your team has started meeting with the Tampa staff. I wanted to suggest that we schedule a coordination meeting um, with the TPO staff and um, with a a number of the different agencies here who are represented around the table. Just off the top of my head, I'm thinking of of two topics. Um, One is that you mentioned that you are starting to uh, develop uh, more commuter-oriented stations in the Miami area, such as the Aventura station, and I'm thinking that that's going to be of interest to the city of Plant City. Um, we uh, also would want to talk about how are we coordinating those uh, modal connections that our chair mentioned in particular. Uh, in our, our downtown Tampa area, um, there, there was also a concept for an intermodal center in downtown Tampa. The Department of Transportation acquired a property for that. Um, that was going to be where the old high-speed rail station was located, as you're probably aware. Uh, we've all done a lot of work to coordinate and bring together our transit connections at that spot. So we have, you know, our Heart Local bus routes. We have our Heart Express bus routes. We have Express bus routes from other counties. Um, we have, you know, I think I've, we've had some of the intercity bus service located at that point. Um, a study now of how we extend our streetcar north, and that would also connect every everything at that spot. So if if we're no longer going to have our, our train to Orlando touching down at that spot, and if instead it's going to be about eight to ten blocks away, I think we need to have a conversation about how we're going to make all of that work. Yeah, I, and I appreciate that. I, I will say as our team looked at uh, stations, getting through that I-275, I-4 interchange, we're heavy rail. Um, and and to, you got a lot going on there already. We... It, it, it was a struggle. We did look. Um, so I'm happy to coordinate. Um, let us, what we commit to do is we need to connect our city pairs and the Aventura and Boca stations and those conversations came on after we were operational with high speed rail. Um, so we'll absolutely be open, but we, we will not have answers for a while outside of, you know, we, we've got a lot to say grace over in Central Florida right now um, and uh, figuring out and as the community is evolving here as well, um, finding those partnerships is very important. Commissioner Overman. So thank you. And I, to, to Ms. Alden's point, I do recognize the downtown interchange would be difficult. Where you leave I-4 would be important. But also where you land as it, it potentially travels through or becomes a destination close to Ebor, that's a historic neighborhood. We're aware. And so um, just get your heads up. It's got to look like brick. It's got to. <laughs> oh, we're aware. And, and the city's been great working with staff. They, they've given us tremendous guidance from uh, height limitations to um, it, making sure that we take that very modern station that you saw and, and figuring out ways that it is incorporating the flavor of the beautiful Ybor City aesthetic. Right. Thank you very much mm-hmm. for that. I appreciate it. Ms. Kefauver, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We really appreciate it. Uh, very informative discussion. My pleasure. 
Um, we have one more status report to go to before we move on to our uh, executive director's report and old and new business, and that is the Planning Commission's annual report and plan Hillsborough strategic plan, and I believe Melissa Zornita is here to present that item. Yes, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Melissa Zornita, executive director of the Planning Commission, and I will very quickly go through um, my annual presentation on the work we have done in support of all three boards that the Planning Commission supports, the TPO, the Planning Commission, and Hillsborough River Board. Um, if we can go to the next slide, Cheryl, um, our strategic plan um, was developed in 2018 for all, by all three boards con in conjunction with each other. It covers these seven areas. You can move to the next one, Cheryl. Um, and we'll give, I'll give a very brief update. You should have all received the annual report with this beautiful photograph of the mural that the Philip Jr. students uh, did in the Tampa Heights area on the cover of it. Uh, next slide. Um, so touching on land use and transportation, kind of the heart and soul of our organization, we've worked on a number of different studies and projects, um, including working with HART on the TOD policy updates, um, things like completing the South County land use studies in Waimama and Balm. Um, we've been working with the city of Tampa on best management uh, our best practices research on mixed use, um, utilizing floor area ratios for residential development. Um, the TPO has done some air quality monitoring pilot studies. Um, in Temple Terrace, we've had a number of plan amendments that have been focused on economic development and job creation uh, as they've annexed land going eastward. Um, we'll move to the next slide. Um, in terms of citizen engagement, um, despite being sort of in this weird hybrid mode, um, we continued to give numerous community presentations. We were thrilled to have the non-discrimination plan expanded from just looking at the, the TPO to an agency-wide plan um, and see how we can consistently across the organization um, improve uh, on a number of measures looking at uh, equity and non-discrimination. Uh, as a part of that, we've already started to embrace that and have a translation group focused on Spanish speaking and making many of our publications um, translated um, to be more user friendly. And we created a video series called One Minute Matters that focuses in this series on infill and redevelopment and missing middle housing in our community. Um, next slide on public, uh, planning partnerships. Um, I mentioned the FLIP Junior Program, and um, you can see some of the kids there in the photo. Um, we were thrilled to work with uh, summer camps in Tampa Heights, Town and Country, and Palm River, um, and teach them a bit about planning, and they become real, became really great advocates for their community. Um, but we've also had great collaboration um, with each of our jurisdictions on different planning projects um, and continued the Garden Steps program, which you can see in the photo there as well. Next slide. Um, in terms of regionalism, um, probably the TPO, is, you all know more, more about this than, than any of our boards because you all also sit on a number of regional boards. Um, there have been over 40 regional meetings that our organization has participated in over the last year. Um, many of the projects like the interactive regional trails map, the rebranding of the Suncoast Transportation Planning Alliance, um, regional resiliency efforts have all been a part of what the organization has worked on in this last year. Next slide. Um, enabling transportation choices, um, ho hopefully knock on wood tomorrow evening, the Hillsborough County Mobility Section will be updated of the comprehensive plan and I think really serves as a great model of how we can incorporate equity, vision zero, and um, context uh, sensitive um, roadway design into our comprehensive plans. We're starting on Tampa's um, comp plan update now and, and looking at incorporating those same concepts into their plan. Um, a number of the uh, projects that you all have seen, such as the more user-friendly um, transportation improvement program documents, the park speed zone pilot study, 
and the update of the Transportation Disadvantage Service Plan were also highlights for this year. Um, next slide. Um, technology and innovation has been dominated by the fact that we're now living in this hybrid workplace and have had to convert many of our public meetings, even ones out in Balm and Waimama into hybrid meetings. And that's taken um, you know, our technology in a different route than we, we had planned, um, but we're excited to make those uh, meetings more accessible to the public. Uh, we've also included some new uh, applications on our website. Uh, you can view much of the 2020 census data in a more visual fashion under the data section of our website. We've created a database of all of the comprehensive plans, and this has been a model that several of the uh, um, other local governments across the country have actually tapped into, wanting to see how that has enabled us to synthesize and see where policies overlap and coordinate and complement each other throughout the plan. Next slide. And then lastly are the internal agency enhancements. It's been important as we've had a lot of change in terms of our workplace and how we've had to do business that we continue to promote positive morale throughout the organization. We were pleased to be named a gold bicycle friendly business and have focused on a number of internal updates, in, including implementation of the non-discrimination plan by looking at our hiring practices, who we advertise to, and promoting um, quarterly diversity training opportunities throughout the organization. And then that, I think the last slide is next, um, which is just that we're continuing as a staff to focus on implementing the strategic plan. The strategic plan has a five-year horizon. So next year in 2023, we will be discussing with all three boards how we update the strategic plan. Um, but uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions and um, hopefully you all received a copy of the report. And if there's anything, um, any questions, happy to answer them. Okay, are there any questions from board members at this time? I don't, Great uh, job, great job. <laughs> we are very blessed. Yes, I, I, I do appreciate uh, the effort that goes into this. Uh, I know we all do. Are there any, are there any, I'm gonna just look one more time. I don't see any questions from board members. So Ms. Ornita, thank you very much. We appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. Um, we are now gonna move on to the executive director's report and then old and new business. Ms. Alden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. We do have our quarterly regional meeting this Friday, the uh, Tampa Bay TMA Leadership Group. Uh, we'll be meeting at the District 7 office. Thank you again for hosting. Um, we have um, a couple of updates on the agenda about where we are with our rail planning, as Commissioner Overman alluded to earlier, uh, an update on our water transit, uh, and also looking at where we are with our state budget earmarks this year. Um, I, this is a little bit different from years in the past, where we are seeing some budget earmarks that come out of general revenue. Um, as opposed to being from the Transportation Trust Fund. So those would be net increases in funding for this district, uh, which has not been our experience in the past. So we're excited to see how some of that turns out. Um, I have brought uh, copies of our recently updated and reprinted regional multi-use trails map. Uh, we have more copies of this uh, if you have parks and recreation staff who would like to have a stack of these would be happy to share, just let me know. Um, and then uh, finally, I uh, wanted to ask you all, a couple of board members have mentioned to me that uh, it could be useful to us to establish um, in our bylaws that you know all, all, of our, uh, all of our members, all of our volunteer members, uh, that we all adhere to a code of ethics. Um, the Planning Commission actually has a great code of ethics. Uh, that its members adhere to. And uh, if it's your pleasure, I could uh, bring it back as a, a bylaws amendment um, that we would also incorporate by reference uh, the Planning Commission Code of Ethics as something that, that we adhere to as an organization. I certainly think that would be fine. I think we'd appreciate that. I see Commissioner Smith uh, has her hand up, so let me go ahead and reach out to her. I, I was trying to get in the queue uh, for old and new business. Okay, I think we're actually at that point, but let me, uh, Ms. Alden, are you, are you done? Okay, so Commissioner Smith, I'm gonna go to you and then Commissioner Overman, I'll come okay. to you. All right, go ahead. Thank you. 
And I, I want to draw the board's attention to um, an item in our agenda, addendum of this agenda. It's item number four of the announcements in the addendum, which says US 301 PD&E study. Uh, there's a public hearing March 24th, 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. And the backup includes the announcement of that. And as I am uh, becoming more and more aware, and I think uh, uh, we, we alluded to, at least in our policy committee meeting, um, it is really important to get on, on, uh, on record what our uh, concerns are for when we're dealing with FDOT projects moving into this early PD&E stage. And to that end, I just want to point out um, this is about the widening of 301 from Fowler Avenue north to uh, past the county line in, uh, up to Highway 56 in uh, South Pasco County. And the announcement shows the proposed sections that would be turning this uh, two-lane rural road, uh, which 301 is in that area, into a very wide divided highway with medians and swales and speeds up to 65 miles an hour going through our rural area and through some important preserves and environmental systems. Uh, this stretch of 301 runs along and through the eastern side of Hillsborough River State Park. It cuts through a wildlife corridor that connects the state park to a system of other preserves and natural lands uh, that have been prioritized by our ELAP uh, preservation um, uh, program. And, and the, these preserves and natural lands form a very large narrow uh, natural area connecting the state park all the way east to Blackwater Creek Preserve, Lower Green Swamp Preserve, uh, which was Cone Ranch, as you know, and other connected preserves in that larger green swamp system. So widening, I'm very concerned, widening the 301 in that area to the extent that these plans are calling for would be detrimental, in my view, to this large wildlife and wetland system. And furthermore, I do not see any reason why this road needs to be widened uh, at this time. It is outside our urban service area through a very rural area where the county has no plans to increase development and density um, within the next several decades within our uh, planning horizon. Um, however, I mean, if, if it were going to be widened anyway over my dead body, uh, <laughs> it should include um, plans for underpasses for wildlife and water mm -hmm. to pass freely from the natural areas and important wetlands on either side of that uh, uh, of that corridor, um, and so to that end, I've been um, uh, gotten this information to our uh, conservation director, um, Forrest Turbeville, and and um, hope that they will provide input, but also want to make you all aware at this early stage uh, of that um, information that is in item num bullet number four under announcements of our addendum. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Smith. And I'm informed that that item is going to be on our agenda next month here awesome. at the DPO. Uh, we're going to go next to Commissioner Overman and then Commissioner Kemp. Thank you. And, you know, thank you, Commissioner Smith, for mentioning that because something that I... Uh, when we discussed at the policy committee uh, a recommendation to bring back to the board a, um, um, a message of how we manage, how we address managed lanes and express lanes, and that, that will come back to the board for approval or signature, I assume. Um, I thought about the same kind of concept to address the wildlife corridors and design standards in Hillsborough County for what has become a very uh, dangerous place for our wildlife corridor, what's left of it in Hillsborough County. 
Um, and as it pertains, for example, this 301, um, that we establish standards on how um, highways are developed within Hillsborough County that actually include um, design standards that provide opportunities for wildlife pass-throughs. I, mean, I don't know what the exact term is, but I know that there have been uh, road designs, highway designs that include the ability for wildlife to pass through and preserve the ability for wildlife to travel to not impact migration as well as to reduce the number of animal death or wildlife death on our highways. Um, so I, I don't know where that fits in our planning or whether it's in the comp plan or whether it's in our transportation plan. But I, I think as a future item to bring back to the board a way that we could actually establish some standards for road design in our community that would preserve wildlife opportunity and migration in our area. So I'll stop there. Thank you. I, I think that's an excellent idea, and I, I see the director nodding in agreement. The, the second item I wanted to ask for a, a report to come back in the future would be to ask um, FDOT to um, bring back a status report on the Florida state plan for electric charging stations along our highways and what methodology could be incorporated on in our urban corridors as well. I know that um, when I traveled to D.C. and met with DOT, they brought to my attention that the state would be required to provide a, uh, a, a report and a study and, a, well, a plan that could, needed to be established and presented to uh, the U.S. DOT if we were going to incorporate electric charging stations as part of our overall mobility plan. So I'd love to get a status report on where that lies, given the deadline is, I believe, at the end of this year, or at least the starting process for applying would be within this year. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Kemp. I accept less be worried about parking garages. <laughs> 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 but <laughs> that being said, um, uh, just a, a couple of things. And thank you so much, Commissioner Smith. Um, as I was going through the uh, backup, I was um, very alarmed at the 301 plans. And even if you look to the future, of, uh, and I'm very pleased to hear that they're on the agenda for next month here. Um, that's significant. Uh, because to, when you, 301 South is a whole different uh, area than 301 North. And I don't think that there's a lot of appreciation for how rural and how, I mean, to huge swaths of land to both sides of it are, are prohibited from ever being developed. They are wetlands, they are protected lands, they are, there will not be uh, any people uh, moving in there. There won't be development there ever. Um, it's not possible, and it's also preserved for the future. The Lower Green Swamp, our, our water source, um, the Hillsborough State Park, and, and you can kind of see that when you look at a map, but um, I was very alarmed when I saw the prospective plans for 301 North because when I've uh, driven that road, I found it to be um, such a wonderful and untraveled place, and, um, and I, I, I don't really see um, where we need to be making those investments. So, but I'm, I'm pleased to see that it's on, I'm very um, pleased to hear it's on the agenda for next time, because I know we had some conversation about that, and I, I felt it was um, disturbing to, to see that coming forward. Um, and the second thing I wanted to say is, I just wanted to, um, it's, it's um, in time. Uh, we've, you know, you made your presentation at the beginning of the meeting where you went yesterday on your bicycle to take the pictures um, to lay out the stakes of the wall, and I found that very helpful. I myself went down uh, yesterday and tried. It wasn't easy to find um, the stakes. That's not a criticism, by the way. It's just the topography, the roads, the uh, difficulty of if you ever tried to go down there and drive a car next to it, which is what I tried to do, to try to and get out and then try to locate. Um, it wasn't easy. And so I thought it was excellent that uh, you did that for us because um, I did, I was able to see some of them and kind of get a sense of the project. But 
Um, I think that was very helpful today. So I want to um, thank you for having uh, that to present. And I knew that they were going to be put up yesterday. So I started going down there myself to try to find uh, where they were. And it, um, I'm glad that DOT was able to put them up, Secretary Gwen, so that we could at least start to know that. Um, the second is that I hope, I know that we are prospectively looking at a meeting that's been discussed since two meetings ago here at the TPO, I think, when we were first uh, asked about this. And you may be uh, speaking to that. But I think it would be very helpful to have um, for everybody to see. We saw the pictures today, which helped, but to or the photographs. It would be very helpful to see renderings, designs, plans, whatever it is, so that you have, uh, from an aerial perspective, and from a ground perspective, you can see exactly um, how this wall is intended to be and to be altered, um, because I think it would go uh, very far away in aiding the discussion um, as, as this continues to, to be considered. If I could just real quick, I think this is on, right? So um, actually, our surveyors went out yesterday and put stakes at every 200 feet. Um, they're going back today to make it every 50 feet. So hopefully, by the time you get out there, they were just staking the alignment, and then they're going to come back and put in some more. So you'll be able to see, I think, a little bit better the flow of the, the, the line. Um, for the community meetings, um, we do have three uh, events set up um, now. So we have a in-person uh, I guess we're going to call it like a charrette workshop with the community on April the 26th. Um, we had a little bit of trouble getting the venue and the, the dates that worked for all the community leaders down there, but April 26th seems to be the date that would work. Um, on April 27th, we're going to be out there all day to, um, to work with people who want to walk along the wall lines and talk about it a little more based on what we discuss in the workshop and the charrette. And then on the 28th, because some folks said that they may not be able to make it in person, we're going to have a uh, virtual charrette. Uh, the purpose of these charrettes is going to be to set up stations that address the areas of concern that were provided to us by the Tampa Heights community. So we can go by table by table and we'll rotate around. So this table may be more about wall placement. Another one might be about what do we do with the vacant properties in that area. Another one might be aesthetics, landscaping, hardscape, stuff like that. So. That's what we have planned right now. We're hoping it's going to be uh, a good event and uh, we can make some progress there. Commissioner Kemp, yes. You're still recognized. Thank you. Uh, so I'll just take an opportunity here because um, I know I've called and uh, talked about this, but it might be a good time to also uh, speak to this because I know I've been uh, called and asked about the process uh, for building the wall, which uh, the pilings and kind of the the shaking, the noise, the issues um, about that. And um, I had not um, contacted back to the person to specifically uh, write that out. They were talking about the process used and the auger process and other um, possibilities. Um, and I'm, you know, I will say that I did communicate that to you and I was going to facilitate communication between the individual. Uh, and I'm sure there's multiple individuals, but one that I talked to in terms of having your response, but maybe uh, it might be a good time to respond to that now since you're here and we're having this conversation. Sure. So um, a few things. We, uh, we've been trying to find the best and least impactful way to do the, the driving of piles. Um, and we've, we've uh, I think, taken a lot of steps that should minimize any amount of vibration or other types of, of impacts. Um, we're using what we call H piles, which are much less surface area than a square concrete pile, which would have a bigger impact on the ground. Um, we're using uh, uh, the type of pile drivers that are much less noisy than some of the other hydraulic ones that are out there, so we've required that. And although we're not specifically required to pre-drill, if you would, or auger down a certain distance um, because of, of where the, the type of piles that are being used, we've agreed to do that anyway 
I think it's more for, I would call it more for um, psychological comfort than it may be. I don't think it's going to necessarily minimize a lot of things because I think the, the, the type of equipment and piles we're using already was doing that. But we put um, the sensors out there to try to see if there's any way to, you know, tell if there's vibrations going to a certain level that would cause us concern. And quite honestly, we're finding a lot less vibration than you would normally expect. A lot of time it's just what's under the ground that you're hitting. Um, we did have a request from somebody in, in, uh, along the Elmore Avenue that was outside the area we were monitoring, but we agreed to put a monitoring station over there too to just, again, provide information and so we can show what the vibration levels were. But, um, you know, so far we've found the vibrations have been uh, very minimal in terms of uh, rising to the level that it would cause concern for a structure uh, in that area. So, and we'll continue. We're looking at, uh, we, we've also got some other types of equipment we're looking at using that, um, and I don't want to get too technical on you, but it has to do with the type of, of pounding off, if you would, of the pile driver. Some of them can use different types of methods, and we're, we're doing everything we can to minimize that is what I guess I'm trying to say. And if Keep I going, could yeah. just, um, and, and I appreciate you bringing up the sensors. I'd forgotten that that being part of the conversation, that they were requesting sensors further away right. um, because of the older homes and the vibrations and the concern within the house, not only of the noise, but the, um, you know, they felt that their house might be vibrating or subject to um, those kinds of impacts. And so um, I know that you had said that you would um, uh, do that. So I, um, I appreciate you bringing that up because I remember that now as part of that conversation as well. And I, I, as long as you're here, I do have one other, uh, it's, I think related, um, and it was raised at this meeting, and it has me very concerned, and I don't know, I know we only got a partial presentation, but I think it's really important that uh, we start community involvement right away. I consider it connected, um, and that is the um, transit project that will be from downtown to uh, across Fowler Avenue, and this discussion that was brought up um, by Mr. Hatton um, endorsing the bat lanes because uh, that's, you know, very contrary to what I see or what I hear. So I'd like um, to see what we are going to do in terms of community input uh, with regards to that um, sooner rather than later because I think it's, it's, to me, one of the most important transit corridors that we have always connecting from downtown, from USF to downtown, downtown to the airport. That's what we always know. And Fowler, to me, what is done in that corridor is, is just fundamental to everything we do in the region in terms of our uh, connecting through transit. Yeah, and, and that should be all covered in our public meetings and in our ultimately public hearings. Um, one thing just to keep in mind, one, one thing we try to do in this region especially because of the lack of local funding for transit is we try to maximize the amount of highway dollars we can use that can take away from the cost of the transit project. For instance, if it's a $100 million transit project and we can cover 50 of it with highway funds, then there's only 50 million that needs to go for transit funds and then the local part might be 12 million if you get 50% federal money as opposed to much higher if you don't. Um, I think the bat lane concept, part of it, and I, I can't speak for the speaker that spoke, but um, I think when they're looking at it is, is if you don't have a really big pot of money to build, for instance, a center line, um, perhaps the bat lane becomes more financially feasible than doing it in the middle. Now, that will all be played out. Though. All the options will be shown. But at some point, again, we have to get back to, do we want another study that can't be built because we don't have the local money, or do we want to build something that maybe we can leverage highway funds to get something going? So that will all be part of the conversation. And will that be presented to Hart? Oh, they're a partner in all this, yeah. I, I know, but, when, but as a board member at Hart, we haven't... We haven't seen it or discussed it. No, because we're just starting on this. Now, I know that Rhythm and them have done some work of their own because they've been looking at redeveloping that whole area. In fact, I believe there's a community roundtable forum coming up later this month or, or maybe it's 
early next month. But um, yeah, we're in the early stages of this. What you're seeing going on right now on Fowler, if you've been up there recently, is some of the safety improvements we're making at intersections that are like a, we found some safety money, we put it out there as an early works project, if you would try to help in some of the intersections. But ultimately, this whole public process will play out where every will, you'll get presentations, Hart will get presentations. I'm sure you're gonna have to vote on a lot of this stuff. So um, anyway, that'll all be coming. Commissioner Overman. Thank you, and actually, I'm very glad you brought that back because I was gonna ask us a, a, a question regarding it. But um, I uh, would like to also, in the community meetings for the 24th, 26th, and 28th, would like to ask if it's possible to communicate to the community um, what the con tra contractors recommended or the, or the projects recommended um, time work for working. I happened to be working at 1.30 this morning and stepped outside and could hear after seeing the notice that, that Chelsea underpass for reinforcing the bridge work that's being done there for that overpass area. Uh, the road was gonna be closed because they were working on that area. Well, I didn't need that notice because literally it was shaking the area <laughs> in the work that was being done at the time at one o'clock in the morning. So while intuitively on highways where you want less traffic um, to, so that it's easier to do that kind of work, um, when you have work that's being done in a community that isn't necessarily impacted, impacting a congested road, hours of operation may not be as normal. <laughs> um, so, and I think it would be wise to make sure the community knows that if, you know, if construction work is being done on our what no noise walls or other other efforts for whatever this project in, entails, that hours of operation that will be that would impact the community's ability to actually function in life, because I will tell you, if I had lived right next to Chelsea last night, I would have been screaming at everybody this morning um, because it it went on all night. But unfortunately, I was about a block and a half away, but I could still hear it and somewhat feel it, you know. So I, I would ask if there's a, um, a recommended time of day for the kinds of work that we're looking at for this DOTI project, that that be explained to the community so they can manage their lives accordingly. Secondarily, um, Hart's TOD study got an additional infusion of resources to do, to conduct additional charrette type of meetings that they've been doing in the Palm Area Avenue to really look at how community design incorporates in the potential developments of the area that that TOD study exists. They got additional dollars to take that part of that um, community input and design for the Fowler Avenue corridor. So I am, uh, while I hear the, 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 the issue associated with dollars, um, is possibly directing the bat lane recommendation at this point. Um, we also locally are looking at ways to help people understand the value of investing, um, you know, a sales tax dollars for the future to incorporate smart mobility planning in our strategies as well as Hart's TOD study that it will impact directly the recommendations of what happens to Fowler Avenue. So I'm looking for great coordination in that conversation and not siloing the, that, that conversation. It, I would imagine that any of your community meetings that discuss Fowler Avenue be incorporated within the TOD study that Hart is doing so that we're not duplicating work and we're coordinating what the impact of opportunity of investment of whether it's state dollars or local dollars or federal dollars, um, that be actually utilized in the most efficient manner. And thank you for the work that you're doing. I think it's important to recognize our limitations, but I think it's also important to recognize efficient use of collaboration for investment in our community as it pertains to transportation. Thank you. And we will. I also want to point out, you know, we had one speaker today who spoke in public comment. That was one stakeholder. There'll be many stakeholders, so no decision has been made. I don't want there to be a thought that this is predetermined. This will go through the process. But I think that was maybe perhaps the reasoning that they were looking at. 
All right. Well, I don't see any additional uh, business. So with that, we are adjourned.